Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Namaste. We carry forward our discussion on the general principles of law and in this module we will have three lectures. Classification of law in which we will look at how the law is classified, what are the different kinds of law, then the rule of law which basically deals with the question of if a government wants to create a law then does the government have all the powers to create a law or does the, the legislature have all the powers to create a law or is the legislature and the government also bound by certain rules that is the rule of law. And then in the third lecture we will have a look at natural justice. Now natural justice is the principles of justice that need to be followed in the form of a due process of the law. So let us begin with the classification of law. And this is a broad classification of the law. You can have international law or you can have national laws. The national laws are also known as municipal laws. International law is divided into public international law and private international law. And similarly, the municipal law is also divided into public and private law. Now, when we talk about public laws, then public laws refer to the relationship between the state or the various nations with each other or the relationship of the state with its citizens. Whereas private law deals with what will be the provisions for a private relationship between say two citizens or between two nations. So that is the broad classification. So public law deals with relationship of say you with the state. If there is a crime that happens, it is not just a crime against you, it is a crime against the society, a crime against the nation. So it will be dealt with by the public law. Whereas if there are two people who have a dispute regarding say who is going to get the inheritance of the parents, then in this case the society has got little to do with it. It is a dispute between only those two people and so it will be dealt with by the private laws. Now, in the case of national laws, the public law is divided into administrative law, criminal law and civil law. And the private laws can comprise things like the Hindu law, the Muslim law and so on. So let us now look at the international law. International law is defined as a body of customary and conventional rules. So basically this is a set of rules, it is not just a single law, it is a group of or a set of rules which are made through customs or through conventions. So basically they have a historical background and these are considered to be legally binding by civilized nations. So if there is a law that is not considered to be legally binding then probably we will not put it in the category of international law. So there has to be a, a consensus, there has to be an understanding and all the civilized nations or say most of the civilized nations must agree that okay these are the legally binding principles that we need to follow. Only then it will come in the category of international law. So this is a body of customary and conventional rules considered to be legally binding by civilized nations in their relations with each other and they are mainly based on treaties between the civilized nations. And as we saw before, they are of two kinds. You can have public international law and private international law. Now public international law is the body of rules which governs the conduct and relations of state with other states, where state is defined as a nation or territory considered as an organized political community under one government. So basically state is a nation or it is a territory. So there is a geographical area that is corresponding to the state 
and this geographical area is considered as an organized political community. So, when we say the state of India, it means the all the territory of India that is an organized political community under one government. So, in the case of public international law, it is a body of rules governing the conduct and relations of states with other states, things like extradition treaties. So, basically, if there is a criminal or if there is a person that has gone and committed a crime somewhere and he or she has also committed a crime in certain other countries, then is there a set of rules that will govern whether this person will be sent to another country, say to, uh, to face the judiciary and to uh, get the punishment. This will come under an extradition treaty. So, if there are two countries that have signed an extradition treaty, then they will probably say that, okay, we are going to send any criminal that has uh, created uh, or, uh, or has conducted a crime in your nation, we will send that person to your jurisdiction so that he can face the court of law and can be given a punishment. In this extradition treaty, there can also be certain uh, caveats that are there. For example, a country can say that, okay, we are going to send a person given the condition that you are not going to kill that person. So, you will not give that person a capital punishment, but you can give that person incarceration for say up to imprisonment for life, but you are not going to kill that person because that is against the morals, the morals of our own country. So, these are the kinds of treaties that are known as extradition treaties. They come under the, uh, the public international law. Then you have laws of the sea. So, for example, if there is a ship that is uh, flying in the oceans and if there is uh, say a crime committed somewhere. For example, this, uh, 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 this vessel is say releasing uh, toxic substances into the sea, it is dumping waste into the sea, then it will be governed by things that are known as laws of the sea. So, this is again an example of a public international law. Then you have laws of war. Laws of war govern things like how do you declare a war? When will you say that two countries are in a state of war? How will the wars end? Then if there is a war, then what are the rules and regulations that the countries have to follow? For example, are the countries permitted to use chemical weapons? Are the countries permitted to use biological weapons? or are the countries permitted to use things like cluster bombs? Are you permitted to bomb, say, citizens of the country that are not a part of the army, navy or the air force? So, things like these come under the category of the laws of war and laws of war are also public international law. So, these are, they are body of rules that are governing the conduct and relations of a state with another state when they are at war. Then you have things like refugee laws. You have things like international human rights laws and so on. Or you have things like the international criminal law. So, all of these are governing the relations of one state with another state or one state or a group of states with one state or a group of states. So, these are all uh, examples of the public international law. Then you have the private international law, which again is a body of conventions, model laws, national laws, legal guides and other documents and instruments that regulate the private relationships across national borders. So, private relationship, you can think of it as suppose in place of the nation, you had a particular person and this person is doing something. For example, this person is doing a business in certain other areas. So, what are the rules that will govern this business? What will be the rights and obligations of this person? Now, in place of a person, if a, a state or a nation is undergoing business or doing business in certain other areas, what are the rules and regulations that this nation has to abide by? So, th this will be an example of a private international law. This is also known as conflict of laws because whenever we talk about private relationships, then each nation might want to say that 
no whenever there is a dispute my laws are going to prevail so for example if there is a dispute between say china and russia then the chinese might say that no our chinese laws are better and they are going to be followed and the russians will say that no the russian laws are better and they are going to be followed so there will be a conflict of the laws similarly if there is any conflict is it going to be dealt with in a chinese court or a russian court so these are the kinds of conflicts that come into picture and so the private international law also known as the conflict of laws deals with these things jurisdiction which is the court that is going to take cognizance which is the appropriate court to hear a case is this the the russian court or the chinese court or probably the court of a third nation so this will be dealt with in the private international law then things like foreign judgments if there is a judgment that is given by a russian court is the chinese court or is the chinese law bound to follow that judgment or not so rules by which a court in one jurisdiction mandates compliance because if you give out a judgment and if it is not being complied it does not mean anything so the rules by which a court in one jurisdiction mandates compliance with a ruling of a court in another jurisdiction this will be dealt with in the private international law and third is the choice of law which substantive laws will be applied in such a case so are you going to follow russian laws are you going to follow chinese laws are you going to follow the laws of a third nation say indian laws so the body of rules or the body of conventions that is going to answer these three things will come under the private international law and examples include things like the un convention on contracts for the international sale of goods cisg so if you are selling goods internationally and you are making contracts for that this is the convention that is going to regulate what will be the kinds of rules that you are going to follow similarly convention on the limitation period in the international sale of goods limitation period refers to the concept that if there is certain dispute that has arisen then for how long are, will you be in a capacity to sue the other party for it for example if you uh, if there was a cause of dispute say 50 years back then today will you be in a position to bring it up to a court of justice or not it is possible that under certain statute of limitations it might say that if there is any dispute it should come within the jurisdiction of a court say within 3 years or within 10 years and if that is the situation then you will not be able to bring this case to any court after 50 years so this is the statute of limitations and this convention on the limitation period in the international sale of goods is a private international law that governs the limitation period another example is the convention on the recognition and enforcement of foreign arbitral awards now arbitration is a means in which the two parties in place of going through the complete legal procedure can sit down and solve, uh, solve their uh, uh, disputes amicably in most cases it is done under the presence of an arbitrator now arbitrator is not a judge the arbitrator will try to talk with both the parties and will try to come up with certain solutions that is agreeable to both the parties now if there is an arbitration that has occurred somewhere then this convention is going to regulate how these foreign arbitral awards are going to be recognized and enforced so this is again another example of the private international law then you have convention on stolen or illegally exported cultural objects so cultural objects include things such as say sculptures or paintings now if there is a, cer a certain cultural object that was illegally exported from one country so for example in india we have so many temples and suppose uh, the idol of uh, from a temple 
was stolen and it was illegally exported. So once it has been illegally exported, will India or Indians have any right to that or not? So this is the convention that is going to regulate that. If there is a stolen or illegally exported cultural object, then how is it going to be referred to? Then you have the convention on the international interest in mobile equipment. So when you have mobile phones or different kinds of mobile equipments, then what are the kinds of interests that are going to be there, will be regulated by this convention. So this is known as the private international law. So basically you can think of private international law as the law primarily dealing with, with things like businesses. And public international law on the other hand will deal with things like refugees or wars, pollution and so on. Then we have municipal laws. Municipal laws or national laws are the laws that are applied within a state. So in this case, you do not have any relations between two states or two nations. You are only talking about the laws that will be prevalent within the territory of one nation. And as we have seen before, these again will be of two kinds, public law and private law. Public law regulates the organization of the state, functioning of the state and relations of the state with its subjects. In all of these, when we refer to as capital S, it refers to the nation. So you can also read it as public law regulates the organization of the nation, the functioning of the nation and the relations of the nation with its subjects. And public law is of three kinds. So you have constitutional law. So basically, when we talk about organization of the state or organization of the nation, functioning of the nation, we are talking about the national laws of a public character. And when we talk about constitutional law, it will deal with things like the basic or the fundamental law of the state. What is the nature of the state? Is your state a democracy or is your state, say, an autocracy or a dictatorship? Is your state a monarchy? or is your state a republic? These are things that will be defined in the constitution of the state. And constitution is the basic law of the state. It is the fundamental law of the state. All the other laws are going to derive their powers from the constitution. If anything goes against the constitution, then it will be illegal or it will be ultra virus. That is beyond the authority. So everything has to comply with the constitution, which is why we say that constitution is the fundamental law or the basic law of the state. Now, constitution deals with things like the nature of the state, the structure of the government. Now, when we talk about the structure of the government, the, the, uh, the point here is, uh, say, the government is divided into three wings. You have the legislature that is comprised of the parliament and the state legislatures. And the legislature makes laws. Then you have the executive. The executive is comprised of the prime minister or the chief minister and all the, min the ministers, plus all of the bureaucracy, which is the permanent executive. So executive, what, what it does is that it executes the laws. And then you have the judiciary. The judiciary adjudicates or tries to solve the conflicts that arise when a law is being made or when a law is being executed. So these are the three different wings of the government or the organization of the government, legislature, executive and judiciary. And the constitution is going to determine the structure of the government. The constitution is going to state whether you are going to have these three wings or whether you are going to have two wings or whether all of the powers are going to be there uh, with one person. So this is constitutional law. And ordinary laws derive their authority and force from the constitutional law. So this is the basic or fundamental law. Then you have administrative law. Administrative law deals with the structure, power and functions of the organs of administration. Here again, the organs of administration are these three organs, the legislature, the executive and the judiciary. And the administrative law is going to talk about the structure of these organs. 
the powers of these organs and the functions or the duties of these organs. It is also going to deal with things like the limits of power. For example, if the legislature is trying to legislate on something that is a power of the judiciary, then will this law stand the test of time or will this law be considered to be a correct law or not. So, this is something that will be dealt with by the administrative law. It also deals with methods and procedures to be followed in the exercise of power. So, if you have the power, how are you going to exercise this is the administrative law. Then we have criminal law. Criminal law deals with the definition of offenses. So, offenses are basically crimes. So, what is an offense? What is a crime? When do you say that something is theft? When do you say that something is murder? When do you say that something is a manslaughter? Is something that is going to be defined by the criminal law. So, criminal law deals with the definition of the offenses it deals with the punishment for offenses. So, what is the kind of punishment that will be given if somebody commits an offense will be dealt with by the criminal law. Now, crime is considered a wrong against the society and not against an individual. Meaning that if there is a person that has committed theft. So, suppose somebody comes into your house and robs the house. So, that person has committed a crime against you, but more than that, that person has also committed a crime against the society. Why? Because if there is a burglary in your house, then probably the people who are living in the vicinity, your neighbors will also be terrified that if there is a, a robbery that has happened in your house, probably the next day it is, it will also happen in my house. And so, the people will be more concerned, the people will be anxious, they will have to spend more money for say protecting their property. And so, ultimately it becomes a crime against the society at large as well. So, these crimes are not just a crime against the individual, but they are also wrongs that are done against the society. So, for example, if there is a murder that is committed, and the person who gets murdered does not have any next of kin. And so, nobody wants to put up a case in favor of that person. Then too, the state is going to put up a case. Because if there was a murder, this is a crime against the society. And the state as a representative of the society is going to lead this case. So, this is criminal law. Then you have private laws. Private laws govern the relations of citizens with each other. So, unlike these laws, you are only going to deal with relations of one citizen with another citizen or a group of citizen with another citizen or a group of citizens and so on. Then you also have other varieties of laws. You have things like natural law or moral law. Now, natural law or moral law is based on the principle of right and wrong such as the principles of natural justice. So, even if there are certain things that the legislature has not enacted in the form of a law, then too it can have the force of the law because the uh, because it is natural that people should be following it. It is a part of our moral traditions, a part of our moral framework. So, this is a natural or a moral law. Then you have certain laws that are made out of conventions. For example, the rules of a club. So, through convention, people can agree to certain rules that they will be followed while they are conducting themselves inside the club. So, this will be known as a conventional law. This is not a law that has been passed by uh, the parliament or by the state legislature. But basically, the people who form the club, they have decided these rules amongst themselves. And if these rules have been written down somewhere or if even if these rules have been followed through convention and if somebody contravenes these rules, then too we will say that certain laws have been broken and these are just conventional laws. Then you also have customary laws, rules followed and generally approved by people such as the customs of marriage. 
so for example if a marriage is taking place when do you say that the marriage has finished what are the things that need to be followed so for example marriages have n number of, of rituals if in place of following 10 rituals somebody has followed eight rituals will you call it a marriage or not so these are the kinds of customs that have come up for example in the case of hindu marriages we say that the marriage is finished whenever the process of saptapadi or the seven revolutions of the fire they have completed so it is immaterial whether or not other customs have been followed so the customs of marriage will be a customary law that is followed and is generally approved by the people then you have civil laws civil laws are remedial laws enforced by the state within its territory so these are remedial laws so basically they try to provide you with certain remedies if you have been wronged by another person then what is the kind of compensation that you are going to receive or what is the kind of remedy that you are going to receive will be dealt with by the civil law so this is remedial law but this is enforced by the state so basically in uh, in our country if uh, say a contract is broken then the indian contract act 1872 which is enforced by the government of india is going to provide a remedy to the person who suffered because of this break in contract and by their own nature because they are enforced by the state so they will be enforced within the territory so by nature they will be municipal laws then they involve proceedings between two or more individuals examples include the indian contract act or the transfer of property act on the other hand we say that there is a criminal law which is a punitive law so civil law was providing you with remedies but criminal law is providing punishments so this is the major difference the civil law will provide you with remedies compensations but the criminal law will be be uh, providing punishments to people who are offenders so criminal law is punitive law this law against again is enforced by the state within its territories the main objective is to pro uh, is to punish the wrongs done to persons and properties and to protect the society against criminals and the lawbreakers so criminal laws deal with things that are done against the society examples include the indian penal code the CRPC or the Criminal Procedure Code, the Indian Evidence Act, the, the Dowry Prohibition Act, the Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substances Act. So all of these are dealing with different crimes. Prevention of Corruption Act, the Arms Act, the National Security Act, the Explosive Substances Act. So all of these are dealing with crimes. All of these are providing certain punishments or prescribing certain punishments for those people who break these laws all of these are enforced by a state in this case the state of india within its territories and all of these are made to protect the society against these people so these are all criminal laws then we say that there are certain general laws so you can have general laws and special laws general laws are laws regulating the conduct of general public in their day to day lives so what is the general conduct that is going to be done by people in their day to day lives will be governed by the general laws courts take automatic notice of any infractions or infringements and people also generally know about these laws examples are things like the indian penal code the criminal procedure code the evidence act the code of civil procedures or the cpc and so on so in a large number of cases you will find that these laws are referred to in things like movies in things like literature in things like radio shows so if you talk about things like 420 so 420 is the section of ipc that deals with cheating and probably everybody knows about 420 Similarly, 302 is murder. So nearly everybody knows about 302. Everybody knows that if you perform a murder, 
then you will be uh, charged as a criminal. You will suffer with incarceration or even death. A large number of storylines deal with these things. So general public knows about these general laws. The courts also know about these general laws. The courts will take automatic cognizance of these laws. So if there is a murder that is conduct uh, that is committed somewhere, the courts will automatically take this into cognizance. You don't you won't have to go to the court and explain that sir, this is a murder because such and such things have happened. No, the courts automatically know that. So these are the general laws. They con they regulate the conduct of general public in their day to day lives. Courts take automatic notice of these. People also generally know about these laws. So these are on general topics. But we also have certain special laws. A special law is a law applicable to a particular subject as defined by section 41 of the Indian Penal Code. So this is not a law that public will be dealing with in their day to day life. This is a law that deals with a specific thing. For example, things like wildlife protection. So not everybody might know what are the offenses that can be committed in a wildlife sanctuary. So these will be special laws. They deal with special topics. They are applicable to a particular subject. They create new offenses not already punishable under the general law or the penal code. For example, in the case of a wildlife sanctuary, if you chase a wild animal, then that is uh, an offense that is equivalent to hunting the animal because in a large number of, of herbivores, if you chase the animal, the, uh, the animal dies after a while. So these things, these kinds of offenses are not something that everybody would be knowing in their day to day lives. These are, spe these are special kinds of things. So these are special laws. They create new offenses that are not already punishable under the general law or the penal code. The IPC does not talk about what will happen if you chase an animal. But the special law such as the Wildlife Protection Act is going to define this offense, is going to create this offense. Now courts do not take automatic notice of the infractions or the infringements. And the rules of special law must be brought to the notice of the courts. So basically, if an infraction or an infringement against a special law happens, then somebody will have to go to the court and present that, that this is an offense under such and such section of such and such act. Only then will the court be able to take a cognizance of this offense. So these are special laws. The basic points are they are applicable to certain special subjects. They create new offenses that are not already punishable under general law, courts do not take automatic notice and you have to bring this to the attention of the court. Examples include things like the Indian Forest Act and the Wildlife Protection Act. Then we also define things like substantive laws. So you have substantive and procedural laws. Substantive laws are rights and obligations of the individuals against the state, including definition of offenses prescription of punishments for the commission of such offenses. So substantive laws are basically full of substance. They basically tell you what is an offense. They are going to define a large number of, of offenses. They are going to define the punishments. They are going to define what are your rights and how the state is going to protect your rights. Examples include the Indian Penal Code, the Dowry Prohibition Act, the Motor Vehicles Act and so on. So, say when you talk about the Motor Vehicles Act, it talks about the rights and obligations of the individuals against the state. Basically, if you have purchased a vehicle, then you have the right of safely using that vehicle. So basically, if there is certain person that is not following the rules of the road, then that per then you have the right of not having that person on the road. So that is your right of safety. But at this, the same time, you are also having an obligation that you have to drive in a safe manner. You need to drive in a vehicle that has a registration number. You need to have certain documents with you so as to ensure that if anything goes wrong, then you have the proper documentation. 
so the motor vehicles act is going to define all of these it will define the rights it will define the obligations of the individuals against the state it will define offenses and the punishments for the commission of such offenses so for example if you are using your vehicle without a number plate then is that an offense or not and what is the kind of punishment that will be given to you if you do this are all things that will be defined by the motor vehicles act so this is a substantive law it has a lot of substance similarly you have the indian penal code the indian penal code also defines a large number of offenses it also describes the uh, or uh, uh, prescribes the the punishments that will be given it also tells you the rights of the individuals it also tells you about the obligations of the individuals similarly the dowry prohibition act so all of these are substantive laws on the other hand we also have procedural laws now procedural laws will deal with procedures so procedural laws are the processes that are necessary to be undertaken for the enforcement of the legal rights and liabilities of the litigating parties by a court of law what is the procedure that is going to be followed for the enforcement of these rights and liabilities so basically the uh, substantive law defined the rights and obligations or the liabilities but the procedural law will talk about what is the procedure to be followed to enforce these rights and the liabilities so examples include things like the criminal procedure code so the difference will be the ipc will say that okay if somebody commits a murder then this person will be arrested and this person will be incarcerated for say 7 years now if or uh, uh, in, in certain cases it can also be a capital punishment but then how is this person going to be arrested how are you going to to determine what is the quantum of punishment to be given will all the murderers be subject to capital punishment or will, will certain murderers be be given a more lenient punishment how are all these procedures governed they are governed by the code of criminal procedure or the criminal procedure code so this is a procedural law it deals with the processes that are necessary to be undertaken for the enforcement of rights and liabilities then you have things like the indian evidence act so if somebody says that a person a has committed a murder how are you going to prove that what is the kind of evidence that is admissible and what is the kind of evidence that is inadmissible for this particular case will be governed by the indian evidence act so suppose there is a person who has heard from somebody that a has committed a murder and this person goes to the court and says that okay i have heard from somebody is this an acceptable evidence or not so things like these will be dealt with by the indian evidence act so the indian evidence act again is dealing with the processes what is correct what is incorrect that is necessary to be undertaken for the enforcement of rights and liabilities similarly in the case of civil cases what is the procedure to be followed so that will be the uh, that will be dealt by the code of the civil procedure now keep in mind that these lists are not exhaustive and these are not exclusive so basically you can also have other classifications of laws and also it is not necessary that you should have substantive and procedural laws that are exclusive of each other or that a substantive law cannot have components of dealing with procedures or that a procedural law cannot define something that is an offense so you can also have combinations of these things for example the certain laws can have both substantive and procedural components such as the indian forest act and the wildlife protection act so these laws define offenses they prescribe the punishments that will be given to somebody who commits this, these offenses and they also deal with the the procedures that will be followed so you can have laws that have components of both of these now there are certain salient points about these special laws that we need to be mindful of section 5 of the indian penal code 1860 says that certain laws not to be affected by this act nothing in this act shall affect the provisions of any act for punishing mutiny and desertion of officers soldiers sailors or airmen in the service of the government of india 
or the provisions of any special or local law. So basically section 5 of IPC is saying that IPC is not going to affect the provisions of special or local laws. It means that the special or local laws are going to have a precedence over the IPC. If there is something that is an offense under the IPC and that is also an offense under certain other special laws, then the if, if it is an offense under IPC, it does not mean that it cannot be an offense somewhere else. So, for example, polluting a water body, especially one that is a source of potable water is an offense under IPC, but it is also an offense under other acts such as the Water Act. So, IPC is not going to preclude the working of the provisions of any of the special laws. Section 4 of the CRPC says that trial of offenses under the Indian Penal Code and other uh, laws, uh, part, point 1, all offenses under the Indian Penal Code shall be investigated, inquired into, tried and otherwise dealt with according to the provisions here and after contained. So, CRPC is saying that if there is any offense under IPC, then this offense will be investigated, inquired, tried and otherwise dealt with according to the CRPC. However, all offenses under any other law shall be investigated, inquired into, tried and otherwise dealt with according to the same provisions, but subject to any enactment for the time being in force regulating the manner or place of investigating, inquiring into, trying or otherwise dealing with such offences. Meaning that if there is a special law and if there is an offence that has been committed under that special law, then that offence will also be, be dealt with under the procedures of the CRPC. However, if the special law says that such and such offence will be dealt with under these provisions, then those provisions are going to overrule the, pro the provisions that are given in CRPC. So, this is what the CRPC is saying. Section 5 of the CRPC says, saving nothing contained in this code shall in the absence of a specific provision to the contrary affect any special or local law for the timing in force or any special jurisdiction or power conferred or any special form of procedure prescribed by any other law for the timing in force. Meaning that CRPC itself is saying that CRPC is not going to affect the special laws until and unless there is a special provision to the contrary. So, for example, if the special law says that the CRPC is going to be followed, then CRPC is going to be followed. If the special law does not say anything, then CRPC is going to be followed. But if the special law or certain or, or some other law says that CRPC will not be followed, then CRPC will not be followed. Right? Then you have the judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court in the Maya Matthew case. So, Maya Matthew versus the state of Keral and others on uh, 2010. So, the Supreme Court said that the rules of interpretation when a subject is governed by two sets of rules, so you have general and special rules are well settled. They are when a provision of law regulates a particular subject and a subsequent law contains a provision regulating the same subject. So, basically you have one law that is dealing with a subject X and then you have law number 2 that is also dealing with the same subject. In this case, what is happening is you have a subject x and then you have law 1 that deals with it and this law came up in say 1980. But then later on another law was enacted, law 2 say it was enacted in 1990 and it is also dealing with the same subject. Then will law 2 supersede law 1 or something else has to be followed. So, in this case, the Honorable Supreme Court is saying that when a provision of law regulates a particular subject and a subsequent law contains a provision regulating the same subject, so you have the same subject, then there is no presumption that the later law repeals the earlier law. 
So basically, you are not going to say that because this law was enacted in 1990, so this law is now null and void. You are not going to say that. There is no such automatic thing. There is no presumption that the later law repeals the earlier law. The rulemaking authority while making the later rule is deemed to know the existing law on the subject. So basically the legislature, the parliament or the state legislatures, they are deemed to know that there is already an existing law on the subject. And so if they wish to state that the earlier law has been repealed, then the earlier law will be repealed. If they do not say anything, then we will presume that the earlier law is going to stay. The rule making authority while making the later rule is deemed to know the existing law. If the subsequent law does not repeal the earlier rule, there can be no presumption of an intention to repeal the earlier rule. So both the laws are going to stay. Now, when two provisions of law, one being a general law and the other being a special law govern a matter, the court should endeavor to apply a harmonious construction to the said provisions. So the court is going to deal with both of these laws in such a manner that both of these laws can be made use of. But where the intention of the rule making authority is made clear, either expressly or impliedly as to which law should prevail, the same shall be given effect. So basically what the Supreme Court is saying here is that the legislature is supreme. If the legislature says that in this particular case, this law is going to be used and this law is not going to be used. This law is being has been made invalid, then we are going to follow this. But if the legislature does not say that, in that particular case, the courts are going to, to deal with subjects harmoniously. That is, they are going to, to take the best portions of both the laws and they are going to affect their judgments in such a way that both the laws stand um, intact. So that is the second point in the Maya Matthew case. Then the third point is, if the repugnancy or the incompatibility or inconsistency subsists in spite of an effort to read them harmoniously. So basically, if there is no way that the court is able to read the uh, both these laws harmoniously, then the prior special law is not presumed to be repealed by the later general law. So the prior special law is going to stand. The prior special law will continue to apply and prevail in spite of the subsequent general law. What this is saying is that special laws have a precedence over general laws. And if a general law is made at a later time, then it is not going to overrule the special laws that was made previously. The prior special law will continue to apply and prevail. But where a clear intention to make a rule of universal application by superseding the earlier special law is evident from the later general law, then the, the later general law will prevail over the prior special law. So basically, when making the later general law, if the legislature says that notwithstanding anything that was done before or overruling everything else, we are making these set of provisions, only in those cases or if uh, the legislature says that uh, with this general law, such and such special law stands repealed or such and such provisions of such and such special laws, they stand repealed, avoided or, null or nullified. Only when the later general law says that, only in those circumstances will the prior special law be, be made subservient. Otherwise, the prior special law is going to stand. However, if earlier you had the general law and there is a later special law and the court is not able to make a harmonious reading, so where a later special law is repugnant to or inconsistent with an earlier general law, the later special law will prevail over the earlier general law. So basically what the court is saying here is that if earlier you had a general law and later on you had the special law then the special law is going to prevail. But if earlier you had a special law and then later on you made a general law, then too the special law is going to prevail until and unless this general law says that with this general law we are 
made, making null or void such and such provisions of the special law. So, whenever in doubt, the special law is going to prevail until and unless made uh, or uh, clarified. So, then the Honorable Jharkhand High Court in this case of Ijaj Ahmed versus State of Jharkhand 2009 said that the special law is a provision of law which is applicable to a particular and specified subject or class of subject. In other words, it will apply on special class of case and have no application in general cases. So, this is made for a specialized case. It is well settled that the special law prevails over the general law. So, this is what we discussed. Thus, the general provision should yield to the specific provision. So, if there is a general provision, then this general provision will be made subservient to the specific provision and this will prevail. In other words, where there is a specific punishment provided in a special act, it takes precedence over the general precedent, uh, over the general punishment prescribed under the IPC. But when there is no specific punishment provided under special law, then the punishment prescribed under the general law that is the IPC comes into operation. So, for example, if there is a punishment for pollution that is given in IPC and then there is a punishment for, for doing the same pollution that is prescribed under the AIR Act, then the punishment that is provided in the AIR Act is going to overrule the punishment that is given in the IPC. But if there is a situation where you uh, where you only have a punishment under the IPC and there is no punishment made under any special laws, then the punishment under the IPC is going to be used. Then we also have a third ruling by the Honorable Gujarat High Court in this case of Isub Khan, Juzar Khan, Patan versus the state of Gujarat in 2018. The expression special law defined in section 41 of the IPC cannot be taken to mean only enactment which creates fresh offenses not made punishable under the IPC. So, basically this was a confusion that the expression special law cannot be taken to mean only enactment which creates a fresh offense that was not there in the IPC. In this lecture, we have looked at different kinds of laws, different classifications of law. But before we move ahead, I am going to give you some food for thought. Let us look at certain laws that were made in different countries and let us now think about whether these countries should have made these laws or not. So, the first one is making differentiation. So, this is section 5.1 of the Population Registration Act 1950 from South Africa. So, this is a law that was enacted by the parliament of South Africa and it said Every person whose name is included in the register shall be classified by the director as a white person, a colored person or a native. So, basically you are classifying people into the categories of white, colored means mostly brown people that is people like Indians or a native. Native in this case means the Africans mostly that have a black skin. So, every person whose name is included in the register shall be when we say shall be, it means must be, it has to be. So, every person whose name is there in the register has to be classified by the director as either a white person, a colored person or a native as the case may be. And every colored person and every native whose name is so included shall be classified by the director according to the ethnic or other group to which he belongs. So, basically you have this law that is saying that you have to differentiate between people based on their skin color. So, is this a law that should have been made? This is another law. This is a law on permanency. Article 1 of the law for the protection of German blood and German honor that was enacted by the Nazi party in 1935. It said that marriages between Jews and citizens of German or related blood are forbidden. So, a Jew cannot marry a German. So, you have earlier you, you created differences, now you have made these differences permanent. Marriages nevertheless concluded are invalid even if concluded abroad to circumvent this law. 
so you just cannot marry a Jew with a German person. This is section 1.1 of the Prohibition of Mixed Marriages Act 1949 from South Africa. As from the date of commencement of this act, a marriage between a European and a non-European may not be solemnized. So earlier we saw that people are, uh, are divided into white, black and, uh, and uh, colored and this is saying that a marriage between a white and a colored or a native is not to be solemnized. You cannot have any such marriages. And any such marriage solemnized in contravention of the provisions of this section shall be void and of no effect. So even if you go somewhere else, even if you go abroad and do this marriage, then we are not going to consider these to be valid marriages. They will be void. This is the Naturalization Act of 1790 from the United States. That any alien being a free white person who shall have resided within the limits and under the jurisdiction of the United States for a term of two years may be admitted to become a citizen thereof. So if you want to become a citizen, you have to remain within United States for a period of two years, but this will only be done if you are a free and white person. It will not be there if you are a brown person, if it will not be there if you are a black person. This is section 2.1 of the Reservation of Special Amenities Act 1953 from South Africa. Any person who is in charge or has control of any public premises or any public vehicle, whether as owner or lessee or by virtue or whether by virtue of his office or otherwise, or any person acting under his control or direction may, whenever he deems it expedient and in such manner or by such means as he may consider most convenient for the purpose of informing all persons concerned, set apart or, or reserve such premises or vehicle or whatever for the exclusive use of persons belonging to a particular race or class. So these are all acts that are enacted by different parliaments. Section 301.31a of the Code of Alabama. It says that you are going to have separate accommodation for white and colored races. Then you have section 10 of the Code of the City of Montgomery. It says every person operating a bus line in the city shall provide equal but separate accommodations. So you cannot sit people together except cases where you have Negro nurses in charge of white children or sick or infirm white persons. If not, then you, are, you cannot make these people sit together. Then you have Section 4 of the Group Areas Act 1915 in South Africa. No disqualified person shall occupy and no person shall allow any disqualified person to occupy any land or premises in any group area to which the proclamation relates. So basically, if an area is a white area, then you are not going to allow a colored person to reside in that area. It is uh, an offense by the colored person who is trying to reside there and it is also an offense by the white person who permitted this colored person to reside inside. So these are all different laws that were made by different countries. And in the next lecture, we are going to explore how do we determine whether these laws are just or not. So that's all for today. Thank you for your attention. Jai Hind.